Are you awake now? Yeah, after that worship, you can't. That's their job. They actually are supposed to stimulate you so much that you couldn't possibly sleep through the sermon. That's what they did. I think they did a good job today, huh? So how are we doing this morning? My name is Teresa. I'm one of the pastors here. David took off. He's a few thousand miles away. I don't know. He's somewhere. He's doing some training, so you get to spend the morning with me. So how are we doing this morning? How are we feeling? Good? You guys are feeling good? Yeah, I'm not. I'm exhausted. I'm really exhausted. If you're a parent or a student, you know exactly why I'm exhausted right now, don't you? You know exactly why I'm exhausted. Because we did like three graduation parties, two award ceremonies, um, a carnival, and six classroom parties, and a partridge in a pear tree this week, didn't we? Yes, we did. We absolutely did. So we're exhausted. You know, and all over the place, this church, we've got graduates. Did you guys see that video a couple weeks ago? We did the graduates. Man, we've got graduates all over the place, and for whatever reason, I seem to know a lot of them this year. Like, I've got people graduating all over the place in my family, my own children, my, my nieces and nephews up north. I got, they're graduating all over the place. And they're all, like, in this little senioritis thing. Like, not one of them will show up on time. Not one of them will do what you asked them to do. Not one of them, I don't even know if they wake up. I think they sleep all day. I'm not sure what they're doing right now. They're just waiting for that graduation day, right? right? I know a few of them that have got like a week between, and I think they're dead asleep in their beds until it's graduation day. So they're kind of just floating through life. And you know what's funny is when you talk to them, they, they'll say they're so excited because they think their learning days are over. They think we're all done with learning this week. That's so funny, isn't it? They're so cute. That's so funny. Because we know that their learning days are just starting, aren't they? I don't know about you, but I know I've probably learned 10 times as much since high school than I ever learned in all those years of going to school, right? This is when they start learning. They think they're going to pack it up and put it behind them and they're going to be done with it, but that's not the case at all. We got lessons, life lessons coming. And it's funny, the older you get, like, we, we continue to learn, like we're always learning, and even I'm still learning now, but the older I get, like I get more surprised when I learn something new, like, whoo, hey, I can still learn. Like, yeah, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Did you know that? Like, you can still learn things. So it kind of surprises you. And I actually had a moment this week where I learned something. I actually, me, myself, I learned. And it was some of the most peculiar places that I learned it. I was actually sitting in a, um, a kid's chapel, children's chapel. Um, this week, like I told you, the church has had all kinds of stuff. We've had award ceremonies. We've had all kinds of stuff going on here. But we had Kids Chapel last week, and the high schoolers were already gone, so I think it was just through, or the, the older, the kids that graduated were already gone. So, I mean, your oldest one in there is maybe 16 years old. And this chapel was designed for them, and I was sitting in it, and I was listening, and, and Anna, she's one of the Roys. I don't know if you know who the Roys are, but they run the school, and it's their daughter, Anna. And she speaks, and she's beautifully gifted at speaking. I always enjoy listening to her, because she has the same kind of humor I do. So I, like, I crack up through all of her jokes. You know, like when none of the kids are getting them, I'm, up, I'm back there laughing away. And, and you know, they, she just has the same kind of sense of humor I do. And she's talking about the talking donkey, and I'm cracking up through the story. It's funny the way she's putting it. And she, then she starts talking about herself. And she says something that just, that just really stopped me in my tracks. Have you had a moment where somebody just says something and like the words just hang there in the air for a minute? And she did. She was talking about herself. And it, it was actually before she had started speaking, she, she kind of stopped for a minute. She said, first of all, I want you to know this isn't me. The real me is not good. If you got to hang out in my brain for a minute, you'd find things like me being judgmental, me being rude, me being critical of you. That's what you would find if you, if you hung out in my brain for a minute, but it's not me. Because the same critical, judgmental, rude person that sometimes lives in my head, that person can also be loving and kind and compassionate. And she said, the only reason that that rude person that lives in my head is loving, kind, and compassionate is because that is God working through me. So she stopped for a moment to say, it's not me, this goodness that's coming out. It's God. And that just stopped me. And it stopped me because, you know, I have those... Those friend, my friends that are friends now and then friends that were friends of mine before I was a Christian. So anybody who's lived the double life like I have knows that you have the friends before, right? And they're usually super critical of you. Like, well, I know what you used to do. 
And one thing that I know that I've fought time and time again is people referring to the real me. Well, the real you isn't that kind. The real you doesn't handle problems this way. I know the real you. I saw what the real you does. And when I would get to that, that confrontation of the real me, what the first thing I wanted to do is defend the real me. No, the real me is not that person. I'm the real me now. I'm kind. I'm loving. I'm caring. This is the real me. That wasn't the real me. That's always what I want to do is I want to defend that. It's my first go-to is no. Let me tell you about the real me. So I'm always defending the real me. But when she said that, I realized that my fight was over. Because you know what? She's right. The real me isn't good. I know we were created by our creator. I know he put us here and he intended us to be good, but let's be honest. We were formed by this world. Were we not? I mean, scientists say that, that children are totally formed and developed. Their personalities are in place by the time they're five years old because of the environmental factors, right? Things that happen to them around them. Things that the world influences into them. They're all formed by five years old. So although they may have been created by God, they were definitely formed by this world. You hear what I'm saying? So you know what? The real me is probably ugly. Just like Anna, the real me has judgmental and rude and unkind and revenge. The real me has done those things, but here's the good news. Is that regardless of how ugly the real me is, God's bigger than it, right? And so today, when you see good come from me, when you see compassion, when you see love, when you see understanding come from me, it's from God, and see, that's what I was doing, is I was taking God's credit as my own. I'm sitting here defending the real me. No, this is me. I'm a good person. I'm taking his credit. But see, it all, it's all due to him, that I'm good, that I'm kind. I don't have an argument anymore. And it just occurred to me in that moment, that argument's gone. So the next time I hear, well, I know the real, real you, I'm going to say, yeah, I do too. Let me tell you about my God, because that changed the real me. The real me gets stuffed away now, because I don't have to deal with that. So here I am in chapel, kids' chapel of all things. Here I am in kids' chapel of all things. And I actually just stopped to worship for a moment, in my head, by myself. I said, you know what? Thank you. Thank you it's not me anymore, and it's you. Thank you. Let me be more like you. I want to be more like you, and every minute I want to be more like you because I know the real me is ready, sitting there fighting to get out. The real me is there. Have you heard that song? Um, oh, what's it called? Lord, I Need You. I was singing this in the car right after I heard that sermon too, and I'm singing it in the car, and, and it says, Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. You do, because the real you is going to keep popping back up, so the next hour you're going to need him again. And so when this song came on the radio, I'm belting it in the car. You guys ever see me at a stoplight? Just look the other way. Just look the other way. Don't pay any attention to me, because I'm singing songs, I'm telling you. She, you're like, that's the one that your kids are like, Ma, look at the crazy lady over there. And I'm singing, but I need you every moment, every hour, because the real me is going to rise back up and take over as soon as it gets a chance. So rather than fighting now to prove the real me is good, I'm just rejoicing. I'm rejoicing that the real me is ugly and God is bigger than that real me and better than that real me. Now I'm rejoicing in that. So I'm still learning. All the time, I'm still learning. And the thing about learning is, is that we all have different ways that we learn things. And that's kind of why we keep different people up here. You know, we have different people that speak. David, David speaks, Tammy speaks, I speak. We're all different. We all teach differently. We all learn differently. And that's because you all learn differently, right? We have David. He's like the total information guy. He like inundates me with information. I'm like, I don't need to know all that. Just give me the important pieces. You know, I don't need all that. But some people like that information. They like, okay, Dee Dee likes that information. See? <laughs> And then you have Tammy, and Tammy just, Tammy has a way of presenting things in such an organized fashion. I mean, it's just foolproof organized. It's just, if it, it was a, if it was a pretty little box with a bow on it, it'd be gorgeous. Like, she just has a way of doing that. 
And, and me, I'm just, I'm just, I'm the one that's teaching you when the kids are in the back screen, seat screaming at each other, like, what does this Bible stuff have to do with that? That's what I'll teach you, right? I'm going to tell you how to apply it to those screaming kids. That's what I do. But we're all different. And, you know, we don't all learn the exact same way, and that's okay. We were designed differently. So each person walks out of here with something just a little bit different each time. And now, you know, I mentioned that song just a minute ago, and Songs for me, or music for me in general, has been, now I'm not a good singer or anything. Lord knows that. I, I can't sing, but, well, my car thinks I do just fine. My car loves my singing, but music is really a big thing for me. I, I, I just connect really well with music for some reason. And when things, like what happened last week, when, when I heard somebody speak a word, and then I heard that song, and the song lined up with it, and it gave that song new meaning, you know, that just works for me. And I realized I've actually been using music as a part of learning and teaching since I was little. Like, I was singing the planets in order. You know how you had to learn those? I was singing a song to learn those. And, and I remember when my, my son that graduated, actually last night, his, in kindergarten, he had the hardest time spelling our last name. I know, crazy, huh? I mean, it's like only 11 letters. Come on, kid. You know, it's easy. So, I, you know, we tried to teach him and tried to teach him, and finally we came up with a song. And my kids to this day, she's going to laugh because she knows the song. We sing the Renkevich song. It's R-E-N-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z. -E -E you know, we, that's what we do. And they, they learned it that way, did you not? That's the way we learned it. We sang that song. I wonder if they did that in school. <laughs> that would be funny. Did you guys do that out loud in school? You did? Good, good. But that's how I learn. I like music. And I'm hoping that this morning some of you share this love for music and learning because I want to use this morning a song in particular. And I want to kind of connect that song to what we're learning this morning. Because for me, what this song does is it just simplifies what's complicated. It just totally simplifies it. Now, I want to be, um, do you guys feel like, are you in the mood for super honesty today or not really? Yeah. Mm. Good, thank you, Dee Dee. All right, so, good. She is in the mood for super honesty, so we're going to be super honest. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I just want you to be, I want to see how many of you are willing to admit that right now this morning, today, right now, you're sitting right in the middle of a storm in life. If you're sitting in the middle of a storm right now in your life, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, there's more. I know there's more. I know there's more. You know why I know there's more? Because this is what it seems like to me. Seems like I have this storm in my life, and, you know, it's, it's like a nice crisp morning when the fog just starts to rise, and things start to get clear, and you can see things outside again. You can see it. It's just starting to come together, and then all of a sudden you hear thunder again in the distance, right? That's what life seems like to me, is every time the fog starts to clear, the thunder starts to roll, right? Like, it all just starts all over again. Like, I never get lucky to have these, I don't have, like, Florida storms in my life. You know, like, the Florida storms that roll in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they, they come in fast and furious, and rain just dumps all over, and it's, it's craziness out there, and then by, like, 4.15, you could go back to the beach, right? It's like it never happened. But see, my life storms are never Florida storms at all. My life storms seem to last, like these long blizzards or something, Right? They're these long things that just keep carrying on. Like, I very rarely get to wake up in the morning, confront some issue in my life, deal with it, handle it, pack it away, and put it in the past by the end of the day. Right? Do we ever get to do that? No, they last days, or weeks, or months, or years, or decades, or centuries maybe. I mean, some of these storms I'm walking through, I start to wonder if there's an end. Like, is there a good end? Is there something, is, is that happy ending, does it even exist? Am I ever going to get, maybe I'm not. Maybe, maybe it won't happen until after I'm long gone from here. Maybe I won't get to that happy ending that, anytime soon. I mean, that's what some of these storms feel like. like they're going to last forever. And I wonder. But after going through this, over and over and over again, these storms. I'm a slow learner when it comes to this stuff, I gotta tell you. God's gotta like run me back through the lesson a few times because it takes me a minute to pick up. I'm like, oh yeah, I should learn that the first time. But you know, over and over and over again, I'm running through these storms. 
And I started to see something. They all had something in common. See, I started noticing that I was right. In some of these situations, the circumstances didn't change. I didn't see the happy ending or the brighter tomorrow or whatever it is that I'm promised. I didn't see that. What I did see, though, was, was that I was changing. Each and every storm, I'm changing a little bit. And I know you don't want to hear that. I, mean, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. People say to you, oh, you'll be better after this, or you'll be a stronger person. Like, you're like, I don't want to be a stronger person. Forget it. I'm over this, right? Like, you don't want to hear that. You'll be better. You'll be, str you'll be stronger. Things will be better for you. But, you. but you know what? It's so true, isn't it? They're right, and we know we're, they're right. That's why we don't want to hear it. Because the thing is, is God's concerned about you and not your circumstance. So sometimes what God has to do is calm the storm in your soul before he can calm the storm of your circumstance. And I want you to listen to that one more time. And it's actually written in your bulletin, so you don't even have to write notes. You can just listen. I want you to listen to this. God will sometimes calm the storm in your soul before he calms the storm of your circumstance. Now, I didn't finish the sentence for those of you looking in your bulletin. You know that. And that's, let me tell you why. I have this inquisitive nature. Do you, anybody have an inquisitive nature? I like to ask why. Why? 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 And the only reason I'm asking why this morning is because David's way far away, because I drive the man crazy with why. He's like, do you have to question everything? Uh-huh. I'm like a two-year-old. I am a two-year-old that never lost that why thing. I st everything. I'm, I, hey, I'm going to take off in my car. Why? Hey, I'm going to do this. Why? I have to know why. I don't know why I have to know why, but I got to know why. So we actually have a code. That, that he taught me that I have to say inquisitive mi or inquiring minds want to know. That's what I have to say because he's, I'm constantly, it's not that I don't trust what you're doing or anything like that. I just, I, I ask why a lot. So I asked why. And for those of you who are inquisitive like I am, you're going to be really happy because there's this really satisfying word in that sentence. This, this word that satisfies our needs all the time. Because because. Isn't that a good word? It's such a good word. Because. So why will God stop to calm your soul and let your circumstance continue to spiral out of control? Why will he do that? Because he's trying to show you something. He's trying to show you something. And this song called Oceans, we sang it this morning. You remember that? It was one of our first songs. This song helped me to figure out what he was trying to show us. Helped me figure that out. And we sang it this morning. But the thing is, is that, like I told you, the, that song earlier in the week that took on new meaning, I'm hoping, I'm hoping today maybe we can take on new meaning because that's what worship is about. It's not just a song. It's not just to stand here and sing. That's not what worship is. Like I told you when I, 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 I was in chapel, I was worshiping. Because worshiping is more than a song. It's, it's a song with meaning. It's a song with praise. It's, an actual, it's a prayer. It's a song that helps you understand. That's what worship's about. So this morning we're going to talk about the Bible story that that song is centered around. It's in the book of Matthew. And it's... It's not one of like the hidden stories in the Bible. It's a, it's a story we've all heard. It's in the book of Matthew, um, chapter 14, and it starts at verse 22. And this is, um, if, you, if you have little, I have like, you know, headers at each section, and, and mine, mine is real simple. It says, Jesus walked on water. <laughs> we know that story, right? We've heard that story before. And it's in your bulletin. We've got all the scripture printed out in your bulletin if you didn't bring your Bible. But let me, let me start with, um, and let me start at verse 22 and just listen to what's going on here. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side of the lake, is what they're talking about. It doesn't say this in that version, but they, he tells them to go to the other side of the lake. While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, they went, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. 
When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now I'm going to just stop there for a minute. We'll finish that story in just a second. But I want to take a look at what's going on there. Here's what's going on. Jesus was preaching. This is what he did. He was pretty good at it. He ran around preaching to people all the time, right? That's, so he was preaching like any other day. And he says to his disciples, Hey, you guys jump in the boat. Go across the lake. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up here. Now, this Jesus guy, I don't know. If I was a disciple, he probably would have drove me crazy. Because here's the thing. He's like, follow me. And then he takes off by himself all the time. Like, Jesus was constantly doing that. Like, here, you guys go. I'm going to go over here. You guys go. I'm going to go over here. He was constantly doing that. I would have been like, why? Why are you going over there? Well, he was going to pray was why. But he did that to him a lot. So the disciples have to get in this boat. And I know they were probably good followers and everything. But they got to be thinking like, oh, he's leaving us again. Man, where's he going? So they get in this boat, and it's not only that, that Jesus left them. They start heading out in this boat, and what do they hear? You know, they hear that thunder. So now they're really like, okay, dude, you just left us, and now we're in this boat, and now we're hearing thunder. And, they're, and I don't know what boats were made of back then. I mean, I can't imagine they were too sophisticated. I don't assume it was fiberglass or had a motor, right? And see, when I'm sitting in fiberglass with a motor, I hear thunder. Oh, I'm ready to hightail it out of there, right? <laughs> Aren't you? But they're in this... I don't know, this little, little boat with it's probably some oars or something. And they're hearing this thunder and this, this, st this storm approaching them. And where's Jesus? I don't know. He took off. He left us. So great. Now we've got to do the storm. And this isn't a quick storm because if you notice, if you notice, it says, shortly before dawn. So these disciples not only got in the boat without Jesus, their buddy who took off on them, and then had to deal with a storm, but they dealt with the storm all night long. Do you know, can you imagine what it's like? I mean, it's not easy. Like I said, the fiberglass boat would be difficult, but the, their boat had to be really hard. So these guys are probably in the storm without Jesus, so they don't know what to do. They have no idea. They're probably getting battered around back and forth because storms are not fun. So they're probably getting battered around in this boat. They're probably soaking wet. The wind's blowing. They're probably freezing to death. And then what? A ghost! Oh, great! A ghost, right? What could possibly add to this any more than what they're already dealing with? They're without Jesus, soaking wet, freezing to death, and now we have a ghost. But it's not a ghost, is it? I think it's a ghost for a minute, but it isn't. It ends up being Jesus. They're probably like, oh, about time, guy. Like, took you long enough, right? And he's walking across the water. And what's the very first thing Jesus says to them? He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Those words are spoken 364 more times in this Bible. Don't be afraid. God actually spoke them in the book of Isaiah. He said, so don't worry, I am with you. Don't be afraid because I am your God. I will make you strong and I will help you. I will support you with my right hand that saves you. God actually spoke that, don't be afraid. Jesus said to his disciples, don't be afraid. And see, those words, they're such simple little words, but that's a loaded statement, man. That's like a shotgun loaded with some ammunition, isn't it? Don't be afraid. Because what comes with don't be afraid is, first of all, we have to accept the fact that we have nothing to fear. In order for us to not be afraid, we have to accept there's nothing for us to fear. And in order for us to accept that there's nothing for us to fear, we have to trust the person who's telling us to not be afraid. So when Jesus says to those disciples, do not be afraid, that's a loaded statement. He's not just saying don't be afraid. He's saying, trust me. Trust me. Trust that you have nothing to fear. He's saying a lot in those three simple words. And, you know, I think that <clears throat> the response he's looking for from them, he's looking for them to say, yes, Lord, we trust you. We trust you. But that song that we sang earlier this morning, Oceans, there's a verse in it that just captures, absolutely captures probably the perfect response Jesus was looking for when he said, don't be afraid. 
One of the verses in that song says, Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't stop now. How grand would it have been for the disciples to say something like, Jesus, we know your grace abounds even out here in this deep water. I know your sovereign hand will be my guide. My feet may fail and fear may surround me, but you know what? You're not going to let me down because you never have and you won't start now. Imagine how Jesus would have just lit up if the disciples answered that way, right? It's just a plea, like, that's trust. That's what Jesus was looking for. He wanted those disciples to trust him. God wants you to trust him. Sometimes God will calm the storm of your soul before he calms the storm of your circumstance because you need to learn that you can trust him. You can trust him. He didn't rush out there to calm the storm, did he? Was he capable? He could have stopped the storm at any moment, couldn't he? But he didn't. The first thing he did was he addressed his disciples. He calmed them first, their souls. And then he worried about the storm later. But there's something that happens after he calms their souls and before he starts worrying about the storm. There's something that happens. And if we go back to the book of Matthew and we finish up that story, I'm going to pick up at verse 28. Here's Peter's response. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Okay, there's a lot going on here that's not being said. Like, really. Peter says, tell me to come out, and I'll come out. And I, I know, man, he's full of faith when he says this. I'll come out to you if you call me out. And Jesus says, come. But I got to tell you, there's got to be some dialogue going on in Peter's head. Like, oh, oh my gosh, okay, really, I'm going to do this, right? Like, there's got to be some dialogue going on in there. Like, ooh, I'm not sure. Should I do this? Mm. He's got to be, he's got to be fighting the flesh just a little bit. I have to believe that Peter's fighting the flesh, because we always are, right? So there's got to be some of that going out. And then he steps out there. And now think about this. Like, put yourself in his shoes for a minute. You see, I'm on water. Like, look, I'm walking. I'm walking on water. Like, he's got to be ecstatic. If you're not going to believe in God at any other time in your life, standing on top of water is going to make you believe, right? Like, he knows now this guy's God. This guy's totally God because I am walking on this water, right? Then what happens? That wind blows, right? Just a soft wind. I mean, and the wind was nothing that wasn't expected. He's in the middle of a storm. That wind's been blowing all night long. Didn't catch him by surprise. It didn't come up. It wasn't something he didn't expect to happen. That wind was going all over. But that little blow of wind, what happens? He starts to sink. This man of great faith, faith so great to step out into the water, with just a little blow of the wind, begins to sink. But then comes the most important part of the story. The three most important words in that whole story is what Peter says. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself unexpectedly in a body of water. I've been thrown into a pool or two in my lifetime. I know that. But when that happens, like, panic sets in, right? Panic sets in, just for a second, even if it's in fun or even, you know, but when you unexpectedly start coming down into water, panic sets in. And even the best of the swimmers, will, we forget how to swim. You know, you can't even think straight. And Peter, I think he's lucky that he got any words out of his mouth because if you would have caught me like that, he wasn't expecting to go in the water. But if I would have been caught like that, I don't know that I would have been able to mutter out any word, you know, because I would have been caught in that moment of panic. But, but Peter manages to say... Save me. Lord, save me. 
the most important story of words in that story. Why? Because at that moment, Peter realized he needed to be saved. That's important. See, as long as Peter was standing on top of that water, he didn't need to be saved, right? And as long as you can handle your marriage, you can handle your career, you can handle your kids, you can handle your finances, as long as you can handle all of that, you don't need to be saved. You don't need a savior. Jesus wanted to be Peter's savior. He wants to be your savior. You know, in my, um, my Bible is written, there's devotions on each side of it um, by Max Lucado. And there's a devotion next to this story that is interesting. I'm just going to read you a little excerpt of it. But it says, as long as Jesus is one of many options, he is no option. As long as you can carry your burdens alone, you don't need a burden bearer. As long as your situation brings you no grief, you will receive no comfort. And as long as you can take him or leave him, you might as well leave him because he won't be taken half-heartedly. God can, will sometimes calm the circumstance of your soul. Or excuse me, God will sometimes calm the storm in your soul before he calms the storm of your circumstance. Because you need to realize you need a savior. You need to admit that you need to be saved from something. It may even just be yourself. Like I said, the ugly me. And the, and the better me is God. Peter's faith was so strong. He stepped out, out, of, out of that boat. My gosh, I don't know that I could even come close to that sometimes. But in a moment, the wind blows and he's sinking. Just the wind and he's sinking. And see, we have to keep our minds focused because they can stray so easily, just like Peter's did. Just in a moment, they can stray. They can stray from something that you knew was going to happen. But they can stray. And see, we get so busy solving our own problems that we don't need a savior, right? We're, we're thinking about what the next move is for our next problem and how we're going to fix that. Why do we need to be safe for it? We've got this plan laid out for ourselves, right? I've been reading um, Jesus Calling. If we don't have that on the website, I'm going to get that up on the website because I love, love, love this devotional. I love this devotional. It talks to you from the perspective of God. So it's a daily devotional that you read, and it's like God speaking to you. It's written from that perspective, and it's awesome. This woman that wrote it is awesome. It's awesome because it just rings true in your ears every day. And let me, I've just read one recently. Let me, let me read this to you. It's out of there. It says, your mind leaps from problem to problem, tangling your thoughts in anxious knots. When you think like that, you leave me out of your worldview, and your mind becomes darkened. See, we can't be saved as long as we're busy trying to save ourselves. We don't need a savior. And see, I think that point just try, comes right home in that, in that song, Oceans. It says, you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery. Well, who did Peter find out there? Found it. Who did he find? He found Jesus. I find you in the mystery. In oceans deep, my faith will stand. Now in the end, Peter's faith did stand, right? But why? Because Jesus was there to help him up. His faith did stand. You know, the book of Psalms says people who do, who do right will have many problems, but the Lord solves them all. He solves them all. Every single one of them all. It doesn't say some of them except for this one you have to deal with right now. It says he solves them all. He'll solve them. And man, once you start understanding that, your world just blows wide open. It just really blows wide open. It's like, it's like things are different. Things are so different when you understand that. When you know you need a savior, when you wake up in the morning understanding you need a savior, like I said, every hour I need you, when you start understanding that, things start happening. And once you get it, man, this is my favorite. This is my favorite verse in that whole song. Is it, this is like a call. It's like a plea to God. 
It's like when you realize you need to be saved, this is the song that you sing to him every day, all day long. You sing this song. Listen to this. Spirit, lead me. Lead me where my trust is without borders. Lead me to that place where I can trust you. Let me walk upon your waters wherever you may lead me, even out of a boat. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander. Let my faith be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. That's what happened on that water to Peter. We think it's Jesus saving him, but it's Peter's faith getting stronger. Right? That's what he's experiencing. Those are some powerful words. Aren't there some powerful words in that song? See, sometimes God will calm the storm of your soul before he calms the storm of your circumstance. Now wait, I'm going to stop right there. Because there's something very important there that I separate. Sometimes God will calm the storm in your soul before he calms the storm of your circumstance. There's a line between those two things. Why? Because one is you, your soul. And the other one is your circumstance. You are not your circumstance. Do you hear me? I hope you, if you walk out of here with nothing else this morning, you are not your circumstance. See, we get this all wrapped up together and we start getting this all confused. We think we are our circumstance. We say things like, like I'm a single mom. I'm a widow. I'm a grandparent. I'm an attorney. No, you are not any of those things. Those are your circumstance. You are a person raising your children by yourself. That's a circumstance that happened to you, right? That's a circumstance of your life. You are a person that seeks justice for others. That's how you spend your day. That's what you do. That's a circumstance of your life. It can change, can it not? I'm a widow. No, what happened to you is your spouse has passed on and you have to live this life without him. I'm a grandparent. No, your kids had children. That's a circumstance still. Your kids had children. And see, we start identifying ourselves with these things. But there's only really one thing you are. You are that soul. And once you take Jesus into that soul, you are a piece of our creator. Amen? That's exactly what that soul is. It's a piece of our creator. So we need to start referring to ourselves as a piece of our creator. We are a part of God. You hear that? How different that is? I'm a mom or I'm a part of God. How much more powerful that is. That's the way we need to live. That's what we need to understand. We're a piece of our creator. And when you start understanding that and you start feeling that, that's who I am. I am a part of God. Your soul can't help but to sing words, words like these. I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves because when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace because I am yours and you are mine. I do that motion with the kids every time I sing that song and it's just like I, you're mine. You know, in preparation for this sermon, I think, <laughs> God has a funny way. I always say that, you know, when you start believing or you start walking in faith, you start doing this stuff, you start having like these coincidental life. Everything's a coincidence. Everything, you know, you're right, like, oh, wow, that's a great coincidence. No, it isn't. It's God working in your life. But anyway, so you have this great coincidental life. And I have a great coincidental life. And yesterday, I actually had to live out what I shared with you this morning. He's got a good plan, doesn't he? He's a funny jokester. I like his sense of humor. But I actually had to live out my sermon. I had to allow him to calm the storm in my soul without calming the storm of my circumstance. That's how he prepared me for this morning. And see, I woke up yesterday and I was faithful like Peter. I did the right thing. I said I was a wreck. But I was faithful like Peter. But boy, was I sinking. I was sinking fast, and I just reached out my hand, and I said, you know what? It's yours. You take it, you have it. I'm going to be content today. I'm going to live my life today, 
and whatever you come out with, I'm good. And I just handed it over that morning. Handed all of it over. And the day when my circumstance spun out of control as it did, in every which way, and every nothing really changed. It actually got worse throughout parts of the day, and it was, it was just a wreck. But throughout all of this, throughout every second of this, there was just this peace that I walked with. Just this peace. And it actually got to a point where I said to my husband, I said, I wish I could just pull this feeling out of me and hand it to you so you could feel it, so you could understand it. It's peace that passes understanding. And I'm trying to explain to him, it's peace that passes understanding. I know what that means. That's what this is. It's, that's what it is. It's peace. And I want to just get, I wish I could give it to you because I, I just want to, I want to give it to you because it was such a great feeling. But here's the crazy part. He never really calmed the circumstance in all of it. And although yesterday had a fairly good outcome, the circumstance overall that I was dealing with that started this whole thing still is not resolved. But you know what? I don't need it to be resolved. Because if I get nothing more than what I felt yesterday, I'm good. That was more than I can explain. I will be testifying to that probably till the day I die because walking in that was good. The circumstance didn't matter. And see, that's where we need to get. We need to get to a point where our soul is so calm that the circumstance doesn't matter anymore. You could have thrown anything at me. I would have just taken it like, whoo, whoo, no problem. It's peace that passes understanding. So now, we're going to sing that song for our, our offering time one, one time more here this morning because I just I want to go back through it because like I was telling you earlier, it's funny when, when you sing something and you understand or, or there's something behind it. It just takes on a new meaning. So I'm going to ask the worship team to join me back on stage and the ushers to come forward and, and we're going to do this. But this time when we sing it, I want, you to, I want you to see Peter. I want you to see him walking on that water. I want you to see yourself walking on that water. Why don't you try seeing yourself out there? Because I'm going to challenge you this week. I, I, I want to challenge you this week. I want you to stop praying for your circumstance. I'll never usually ask you to stop praying. But I'm going to ask you to stop praying for your circumstance, and I'm going to ask you to start praying for God to calm your soul in it. To calm your soul, not your circumstance. I want to challenge you to try that this week. And I want to see if you come back next week and you want to take that feeling that you have inside of you and give it to somebody. That's what I want to see happen. So I'm challenging you, because that's what I did, is that it was okay for a moment that my circumstance wasn't going to change. It's okay. It's okay for eternity now. I'm good. Something tells me, though, is that as soon as you get okay with it never changing, it's a moment God will swoop in and change it for you, right? So the Lord bless you as you give and worship. <laughs>